Welcome to Oddly Real. I'm Nem Stefanovich. The energy output from stars is one of the greatest power sources in the universe. Our own sun has been providing energy to the Earth in the form of light and heat for four and a half billion years, and will likely continue to do so for another five billion years. Yet, the true underlying source of that immense power lies locked up within the incredibly tiny volume of the atomic nucleus. It is within the heart of stars that immense temperatures and pressures create the conditions to release some of that nuclear energy. It is a credit to our human ingenuity that we have also been able to utilize and release the power of the atomic nucleus right here on Earth. Some of this energy is released in carefully controlled amounts in nuclear power plants to provide for the energy needs of our society. Alternatively, nuclear energy has also been used to unleash devastating destruction in the form of uncontrolled explosions. In this episode, we explore the realm of the atomic nucleus to understand the source of this nuclear power. Additionally, we learn about the techniques to unlock this energy through fission and fusion reactions and their applications. The atom is the smallest piece of matter that retains its elemental identity. There are 118 officially recognized elements on the periodic table, with a little more than 92 being naturally occurring elements or elements found as byproducts of unstable elements. The remaining elements have been artificially synthesized using high energy particle accelerators, many of which only exist for fractions of a second. Atoms are very small, too small to be seen using light or a microscope. Their structure consists of protons and neutrons within a nucleus at their core, surrounded by a cloud of electrons in various orbitals. The number of protons within the nucleus determines the identity of the atomic element. For example, the element helium has two protons. However, helium can have different numbers of neutrons which would represent different isotopes of the element. For example, helium-3 has two protons and one neutron, whereas helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons. Similarly, the uranium atom has 92 protons, but the isotope uranium-238 has 146 neutrons, whereas uranium-235 has 143 neutrons. The diameter of atoms are on the order of 0.1 nanometers, or 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. Astonishingly, the nucleus of the atom is approximately 100,000 times smaller, with a diameter around 10 to the power of minus 15 meters. The atomic nucleus contains more than 99.9% .9 of the atomic mass of the atom. It is within this concentrated nucleus that is the source of the immense energy that fuels the stars. The strong force is the mechanism by which nuclei are held together. To see this, notice that the nucleus is made of protons, which have positive charge, and neutrons, which have a charge of zero. If the strong force was not present, the nucleus would explode due to the repulsive electric forces between the positively charged protons. Yet, the strong force holds the nucleus together, overcoming the large repulsive electric forces. It is from this strong binding force from which nuclear energy is obtained. For example, we can analyze the nuclear binding energy to build up a helium atom from its constituent parts. One atomic mass unit, or one AMU, is defined as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom, which equates to approximately 1.6606 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. A lone isolated proton has 1.00728 AMU, and a neutron has 1.00866 AMU. Thus, in theory, if we combine two protons and two neutrons together, to make a helium-4 nucleus, we should get 4.03188 AMU. However, the real-world physical measurement of the mass of helium-4 is 4.0015 AMU. It's lighter than expected. What happened? This is called the mass defect. The mass defect here 
is the missing expected amount of mass, which is 0 0.03038. The reason why the mass is less is that when helium-4 formed, part of its mass was converted into energy according to Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. The helium-4 nucleus is actually in a lower energy state than the individual protons and neutrons on their own. So creating a helium-4 nucleus actually releases energy by converting some of its mass into that energy. That energy is what we call nuclear binding energy. We can calculate the nuclear binding energy for the helium-4 atom. This is done by converting the mass defect into its energy equivalent using E equals mc squared. In this case, if you plug in 0.03038 AMU for the mass in the equation and convert the units appropriately, we get the binding energy as E equals 28.34 mega electron volts, which is 7.08 mega electron volts per nucleon. A nucleon is another name for a proton or a neutron. So what does this mean? One way to think about it is that by forming the helium nucleus, each nucleon will contribute 7.08 mega electron volts to the released energy from the nuclear reaction. Alternatively, in the reverse process, it requires 7.08 mega electron volts of energy per nucleon to pull the helium-4 nucleus apart into its individual protons and neutrons. The same calculation can be done for all of the elements, and the resultant binding energy per nucleon can be plotted on a graph to provide some amazing insights into nuclear energy. The information in this binding energy graph is a guide to the energy within the atomic nucleus. Notice on the left-hand side, there's a large jump up in binding energy per nucleon from hydrogen to helium. This nuclear reaction is very energetically favorable to release large amounts of energy. This is called fusion, and it's what happens within stars. Notice the right half of the graph also has an upward trend to higher levels of binding energy per nucleon when we move from right to left. Thus, it is energetically favorable for large nuclei to break down into smaller nuclei to release energy. For example, Uranium undergoes a series of radioactive decays that make its nucleus less massive and more stable. Moreover, this demonstrates how fission reactions, which break down large nuclei, produce energy which can be harnessed in nuclear plants to generate power for the use by civilization. Additionally, look at the highest point on the graph, which describes the binding energy for the nucleons of iron. They have the highest binding energy at 8.8 .8 mega electron volts per nucleon, which means it takes the most energy to separate the nucleons apart from this atom. This makes iron an extremely stable atom, and it's one of the reasons why iron is one of the most common metals in the universe. You could say that all nuclei aspire to be iron. Nuclear fission is one process to extract nuclear energy from atoms. When a nucleus is amenable to breaking up into pieces that are larger than alpha particles, we call the nucleus fissile. The uranium-235 isotope is one such example. It is found in nature in small amounts, approximately 0.7% of naturally occurring uranium. Spontaneously, uranium-235 will break apart into smaller nuclei some neutrons, and it will release energy. This is different from uranium-238 that tends to undergo simple radioactive decay into a steady series of steps into less massive elements. It's the special properties of uranium-235's fission reaction that scientists recognized as having the potential to unleash large amounts of useful energy. Uranium-235 can also be induced into nuclear fission by an interaction with a free neutron particle. Notice that the free neutron not only triggers the fission reaction,
but the neutron is also available for reuse in the product of the reaction, plus two more neutrons. The rate of the fission reaction depends on both the concentration of fissile nuclei and the number of free neutrons within the material, which we call the neutron flux. In a nuclear reactor, the neutron flux and the rate of fission is regulated by inserting control rods which absorb neutrons into the material. Example neutron absorbing materials include indium and cadmium. Conversely, lifting out the rods increases the neutron flux to increase the rate of fission. It's important to note that many types of nuclear reactors use slightly enriched uranium. This means the uranium fuel has a few percent more uranium-235 than what's present naturally in uranium samples. The uranium-235 is enriched from around a concentration of 0.7% up to around 5% of the total sample. However, the concentration of uranium-235 is still far below the threshold needed to cause a nuclear explosion in a power plant. If you've heard about nuclear disasters that were the result of accidents from nuclear power plants, they involved high temperatures and the release of nuclear materials into the surrounding environment, not a nuclear detonation. Alternatively, fission is also sufficiently powerful that it has been used to create nuclear weapons. In this case, uranium-235 is enriched from its natural concentration of 0.7% of a uranium sample up to 80%. This ensures the availability of lots of neutrons. The idea behind a nuclear weapon is to unleash as much nuclear energy as possible in a short, uncontrolled burst. If there is enough enriched material together, called the critical mass, the nuclear reaction will take place spontaneously. The critical mass turns out to be around the weight of a human being. Finally, even more energetic than fission is nuclear fusion. Fusion is the creation of larger elements from smaller ones. This is energetically favorable, meaning that energy will be released when fusing elements up to iron 56. However, fusion is not easy to achieve since two nuclei will repel each other very strongly due to the force of electrical repulsion called coulombic repulsion. Fusion is able to occur within stars due to the immense temperatures and pressure within. In fact, it is the fusion process within stars that is responsible for the heavier elements all throughout the universe. Stars produce the heavy elements and upon their death, certain massive stars undergo a supernova explosion, which seeds a wide area around them with these materials. If this process did not take place, then our universe would consist mostly of hydrogen and helium with trace amounts of lithium from the early days of creation. To quote the famous Carl Sagan, we are all made of star stuff. The atoms of the earth and even the atoms of our bodies originated from within stars that lived and died long ago. There are many different ways to synthesize helium from hydrogen atoms and the actual fusion process within the sun occurs in many different ways. Our sun's core has a temperature of approximately 15 million degrees Celsius, which separates hydrogen atoms into a plasma consisting of separate protons and electrons. These conditions make it possible for fusion to occur. In one process, four protons can combine together to produce one helium nucleus and two positrons. However, we are unable to achieve this type of reaction here on Earth, since we can't reach the temperatures and pressures required. One alternative reaction that takes place in the sun involves deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen that combine to produce a helium atom, a neutron, and energy. The output neutron particle can convert another deuterium atom into tritium to support additional reactions. This reaction can take place using temperatures of a few million degrees Celsius, which is much more attainable here on Earth. The deuterium-tritium reaction was applied in the first hydrogen bomb detonated in 1952. An immensely powerful weapon 
that used fusion to release the power of the stars right here on Earth. This device was so powerful that it required a fission-based nuclear explosion to create the heat and pressure necessary to trigger the fusion power of the bomb. The deuterium-tritium reaction is also being used in modern times in an effort to produce the first sustained fusion reaction for nuclear energy production. Commercial nuclear plants today all use fission for power generation. A fusion-based nuclear plant would produce significantly more energy output and would also be environmentally cleaner. Just recently, a tokamak device, or a device used to produce fusion power, broke a record to maintain the required hot plasma for over 22 minutes, reaching temperatures over 50 million degrees Celsius, or three times hotter than the sun's core. The goal will ultimately be to produce temperatures as high as 150 million degrees. Tokamak devices work by using superconducting electromagnets to produce incredibly powerful magnetic fields to confine plasma to create the required conditions for fusion. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and remember, oddly real, really interesting.